Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Episode number 41 of the Mark Martin Podcast, and we're going to go to the year 2001. It's time to head to the 2000 and talk about the Viagra sponsorship, the first year of it, and much more. But before we do that, make sure to head on over to markmartinpod.com, markmartinpod.com. Click that listen button and subscribe on your favorite podcast player, whether it's Spotify, Apple, Android, or YouTube, or one of many. Make sure to hit subscribe and get all of the latest episodes right in your podcast player. While you're at it, make sure to connect with us on social media at Mark Martin Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But Mark, we're going to go into the year 2001. It's the first year of the Viagra sponsorship. You touched on that in prior episodes. Let's roll into the year 2001 here on the Mark Martin Podcast. Okay, Barry. Well, first of all, you know, we uh, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit about I want to remind everybody who's listening that, you know, that I, what I say and what I recall is the way I saw things. And if you were standing right next to me, you might see things and recall them differently. So I'm not saying that what I say on these podcasts is 100% accurate because it's not. It's based on my memories the way I saw things and the way you perceive things is, you know, can be different than someone uh, else that sees the same thing, perceives them. So, you know, that's just something to to keep in mind. These are based on my memories uh, and things that were important to me through the years. Uh, And I did uh, talk a little bit about the uh, Viagra sponsorship and our partnership with Pfizer. Pfizer is a major, major corporation. Um, this was at the time, probably the biggest deal that had been landed in NASCAR, uh, from a a monetary standpoint, as well as from, uh, you know, they're putting money behind their sponsorship. Activation, they call it now, I think. Where they put so much behind the television ads. I mean, they had ads even on primetime network stuff, which you just don't, you didn't see prior to this in NASCAR, really. Uh, Or if you did, it wasn't very much of it. So this was a big feather in our cap from that standpoint. Uh, even though the drug Vi- Viagra, you know, had a stigmatism to it, you know, where people wanted to make jokes and be funny about it and whether or not you should be ashamed about having erectile dysfunction or anything else, you know, however you feel about that is up to you, but there were some things that I wanted to go over. First of all, when we made this deal, as I said in the prior podcast uh, to this one was, it was very important to me that we focused on men's health in general. And so Pfizer uh, promised that they would do Uh, especially in 2001, they would come out of the gate really strong about encouraging men to get checkups and just uh, do the the health uh, kinds of things. They set up a tractor trailer that went to every race on the circuit and gave free health screenings to men at the racetrack uh, before you know, at every event. So you could go, instead of having to make an appointment to go see a doctor, you could go in and get, 
you know, all your tests run and checked out and everything. This was something that was really important. We did a lot of advertising uh, to encourage men over 40 to go get checkups and health screenings and stuff. So that was kind of the focus of 2001 uh, as far as my affiliation with Pfizer and what Pfizer focused on and what, what I helped them uh, promote. And it was uh, something that I was actually really proud of. It was a really great cause, I would say. Uh, you know, if we changed anybody's lives for the good, uh, that was something that I was really proud of. And if uh, someone caught a, a, a illness that was in the early stages that was treatable that otherwise would have not been noticed uh, and let go to the point where it wasn't treatable, then, you know, it could have made a major difference in, in that person's life. So those, that's kind of where we were at. So we, we come out of the gate talking about the racing part of it and my hate, hate relationship with Daytona's Speedway continues as we go to Daytona and only qualify 22nd and we have trouble in the race. I, I had trouble at Daytona all the time. If it wasn't mechanical problems, it was wrecks. It was actually just, I called Daytona, uh, the Daytona, you know, they always said it was, uh, uh, the world center of speed, I think, or world center, whatever it was, world center of speed, I think, or world center of racing. I called it the world center of pain for me. Uh, so anyway, we go to Daytona, um, Jimmy Finnick and I, you know, have had great years together, 97, 98, 99, even 2000 was, uh, was a decent year on the racetrack. And, uh, we, heck, we go to the next race is Rockingham and qualify 17th and finish 20th as well. So I'm just looking at the stats right now. And I just want to say that 2001 with exception of having a new sponsor, uh, and the good things that we did there and some other good things I'm sure that we did or that I did or whatever that I can't remember, uh, don't remember. It was pretty much a pathetic season. Uh, you can look at the stats and tell real quickly. If you go down the list, one thing that you control a lot of the circumstances is qualifying. When you talk about 500 mile races, controlling the all the circumstances and the outcomes are much more difficult. But qualifying is a good indicator if you're hauling ass or not. And, you know, I can sit here and just see, well, we only got two poles, two poles for me in a season is not very good. And they were both on short tracks, oddly enough. So I'm sitting here knowing that the lack of speed was in arrow. I mean, I, I just know it because I know how this stuff works. I see that we qualified on the outside pole at Loudoun, uh, one of the races as well. So Loudoun would be less aero dependent than most, most places. Somehow or another, we got off on aero. We had them killed in 98 on aero with the new Taurus. And we just eventually got, got ourselves behind. We just didn't run good. I mean, I'm looking at, 41st uh, at Atlanta, 34th at Bristol, 39th at Martinsville, 40th at Fontana. I mean, this is all early in the season. My gosh, just pathetic. Now, 32nd, 32nd okay. at Dover, 34th at Rockingham. Now, with that new sponsorship probably came, you know, some some pressure uh, to perform with, you know, the Viagra sponsorship. I mean, do you recall any of that year? I, I, you know, I know that there's not a lot of good finishes. There's there's a couple polls, but was there any, 
I mean, was there any pressure from from that side? You know, knowing going into this, you got a really great program going, really great sponsorship. You're doing a lot of wonderful things with uh, with Pfizer on the men's health side. But is there any pressure from that? And and, and was that part of the results? Well, pressure starts to build. Uh, obviously, they were thrilled to sign us. You know, uh, one of the very top cars, you know, one of the top five or six cars on the circuit had been historically since 1989. So we have, you know, they were, they had scored a big one being able to sign us and they obviously had expectation expectations. They were smart enough to be understand that, you know, racing was, uh, you know, was a little bit cyclical, um, and so I didn't feel pressure coming right out of the gate. And as we went through the year of 2001 and we just were miserable, miserable finishes, miserable speed, I got more consumed with that than I did. You know, I, I, I could have, I was totally tone deaf to the possibility that Pfizer might have been hoping or expecting more out of us than what we were giving. Uh, it was the 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 sound was deafening from to me from uh, the performance on the racetrack. And you know we did get you know we got you know we did, we ran in the top ten when we didn't have trouble, but it was more often the latter part of the top ten rather than top fives. Um, it was just really a challenging season, and we just just one of those years where not only did you not have the speed, but we also had a lot of bad finishes. And so, this was the first year, probably since 1988, that we hadn't been a top ten car points wise. And a top five car, really, uh, for the most part, points-wise as well. And it was just, we had just dug a hole. And you talking about frustrated. We were frustrated. And just just one of those, one of those times in my career where the frustration was just at the breaking point uh, by the end of the year. You know, there was no question in my mind that we had to make some kind of change going forward. So, you know, I obviously Jack knew as well. You know, by this point in time, my relationship with Jack was really strong. Uh, Jack and I had really bonded and understood and knew each other and uh, was in the uh, early stages, I would say, of becoming total blood brothers. And so, you know, Jack and I sit down and talked about what what to do. And this was during uh, the time that, that Kurt Bush, you know, had moved, Jack had moved him into the cup uh series and had some young guys around him and a young team around Kurt that was really, really doing well. Kurt was blindingly fast. Uh, he was hitting a lot of stuff still, but he was getting better at not hitting stuff and he was blindingly fast. Um, but wasn't really having the kind of success that, that he was capable of yet, but he was certainly showing speed. So Jack and I decided that what we should do is swap teams with, with Kurt and put me with the young crew chief. I'd known Ben Leslie forever and, uh, and all his guys were young guys. It was sort of an, you know, er, upstart team, um, with, with rookie uh, built around the uh, rookie driver. And we just felt like that Jimmy Finnig would be a 
tremendous influence on Kurt in every way, uh, from the experience side of it to the calm and patience that Jimmy Finning had always shown, uh, his amazing experience and, and the success that he'd had with, with Bobby Allison and myself and back even all the way back into the ASA days, 85 and 86 with, with me. It was just, uh, it was ideal for Kurt, we felt. And I was, uh, I felt good about going with his team. They were showing more speed than I was and showing much, showing more potential than I'd managed to show throughout 2001. So I was, I was ready to make that change. So we, we, uh, we decided to pull the trigger on that and, and make that change. And this would be, this would be a big, big deal. This was really a big deal. It was, uh, was me stepping out of a comfort zone of having guys around me who had a lot of experience and, and then I was comfortable with to moving into a, a team where most people on that team had not been in a, a, a victory lane had not won a race, never experienced winning a race in at the cup level. So it was something that was a big change, but something that we felt like we needed to move forward on. So let's roll right into 2002. I mean, 2001 is pretty nondescript, a lot of struggling, uh, a 12th place finish, but then a, a massive uh, change not only for yourself, uh, for the entire team, for all of Roush Racing. In 2001, I mean, looking at the stats, was was a struggle for the entire team. Uh, then the crew chief changeovers, and, and not only yourself, so you went from a 12th place to a second place uh, finish in, in, in 2002, and we'll, and we'll touch on that. But the entire team actually had had quite a turnaround and, uh, and, and much better finishes in 2002. And was that because of, of, of all this changeover that you did to the entire organization? Yeah, I, you know, here's – there was just a lot that went into it. Um, we all came out of our comfort zone and of course, Ben Leslie was excited beyond belief to get, uh, get to work with me because he'd worked with me, you know, in the Bush series as not as a crew chief, but just as a crew guy. And, but you know, he understood the, my history, knew my history and was excited to work with me as well as all his guys. Look, they had been very frustrated with Kurt. This was at a time in Kurt's career where he was super young, quite volatile, blindingly fast, and hit a lot of stuff and was not completely, uh, you know, under control with his emotions and everything. And so they, this team was thrilled to work with me. And that was always, that's always a good feeling. So we just come out of the gate. We'll just get started right, right away and start talking about some results. We go to the world series, uh, the world center of pain for Mark Martin and finish sixth. So the sixth place coming out of the gate at Daytona is a absolutely fabulous for us. And then we go to Rockingham and I don't know what happens there, but we wind up with a 21st place finish, but then we go to Vegas and finish third and Atlanta finish eighth. In Darlington, we have some trouble, uh, finish 29th, but then we get hop back on, you know, and start reeling off top, top tens and top fives. The guys, you know, we, we've come right out of the gate with, with faster race cars. 
but not absolutely spectacular. We're really doing a good job of racing the car and bringing home good solid finishes because we, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty steady on the racetrack and pretty darn fast. And so we start, this is back when they have the no bull five, uh, series where they pick a certain race and they call that a no bull five race. And if you finish in the top five in that particular race, let's say Vegas, if you finish in the top five at Vegas, let's just say, then you're eligible for a million dollar bonus. Those five cars are eligible for a million dollar bonus, let's say at Charlotte. So it's another no bull five race. So if one of those five cars wins the race at Charlotte, then they get a million dollar bonus. And so we managed to be, get into the No Bull Five for the Charlotte race. And Charlotte is a really good racetrack for me. It's still the old Charlotte. It hasn't been repaved yet. So at this time, it's still my favorite track above Dover because it hasn't been repaved. The last repave, it fell off the top of the list. It changed it completely but this was my favorite racetrack charlotte it was a place that i really run good at it's a no bull five race so we're eligible for a million dollar bonus at that point in time i make a commitment when ben starts getting excited about we're going to build you a car we're going to build you a special car We've learned, I've learned how you'd like a loose race car and we're going to pull the nose forward. We got wind tunnel time. We're going to pull the nose forward and we know how to, you know, make it still fit the template, pull it forward. And we're going to push the nose over to the left while everybody else like Matt Kenseth example is pushing the nose over to the right to make side force, um, you know, we're going to, uh, in the rear, we're going to push the nose over to the left. Cause that's what you like. You like a loose race car. And so I make a commitment that if we win that million dollar bonus, I uh, will share half of that, half of my take of that with the team with, with you know, with, 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 with the, with the team, you know, my guys, and so they build the car, they take it to the wind tunnel. It makes astronomical front down force. We set up a test, Ben does, for Charlotte. So we we're going to even test at Charlotte. And I show up for the test at Charlotte in the garage. This is back when not everybody tested, only people rented the track. So there were some other guys that shared the track with us, maybe four other cars and us. So there wasn't many people in the garage, many haulers, our haulers wide open. It's a beautiful early May, a uh, beautiful day in North Carolina and the haulers wide open. And this music is busting out of this thing. And I mean, it sounds good. It's a beautiful day. We got a badass race car, makes a ton of front down force, and Dr. Dre, the chronic, is booming out of this. And it's my first expo exposure to Dr. Dre. And well, who uh, who you know, who is playing Dr. Dre? That would be Ben Leslie. That's Ben. Ben's a crew chief. So he's, he's the he, boss. So he's the one that started this party with all your uh, with all your interest in hip hop. This is why I'm telling the story, because Ben Leslie gets the uh, credit for this, and Dr. Dre gets the credit for this. Uh, still to this day, one of the greatest rap albums of all time, Dr. Dre, the Chronic so, chronic album. So, I mean, and he, he plays it, you know, on re just repeat all day. 
man, I'm telling you, man, this is good. And we're fast, and it's all good. So that's kind of how I get started on Dre, and then uh, I, eventually I go from Dr. Dre to Eminem, and then eventually some of Matt's friends ask me if I've ever listened to Gucci Mane, and I discover Gucci, and I listen to Gucci this morning. I listen to Gucci damn near every day. The so I'm I'm definitely a Gucci main fan, but anyway, back to the race racing. So we go to Charlotte, and I don't know what happened qualifying. We only qualified twenty fifth, um, maybe because the car is so loose it doesn't want to be the grill taped up solid, makes it pretty much impossible to drive. Uh, but anyway. To boil it down to the final end of the race, Jimmy Johnson is doing his Jimmy Johnson Superman thing at Charlotte, which at that time was he was the king of Charlotte. He owned Charlotte. He was leading. Kenseth was probably running second. I was running third or fourth or something. On the last pit stop, we come in and pit. And Jimmy has a problem in the pits. And my pit crew beat Matt's pit crew. I beat Matt out of the pits. So they put me in the lead after the last pit stop. And Matt's really, really good uh, and has run ahead of me pretty much all race. But they throw the green flag for this last run. And it's on. And I ain't going to give up for much of nothing. Even though my car has gotten really tight, started getting tight. Now, this is going into the night, and some people might blow on or blame that on uh, the, because it got nighttime and cooled off. But uh, there's more to that story. My car also got really, really hot, really hot inside. Not the water temperature, but inside the car. It's cooking me. But this race is on, dude. And Matt is trying his best. And we're coming up on lap cars with just a few laps to go. And I ain't got no time. You know, I don't, I can't afford to lose any air off my nose. I can't afford to get any delay. Matt is fixing to pounce on me. And I split those, these th guys three or four wide just slashing through the through the field through the through the lapped cars and i mean it was one of those deals that would just about take your breath pretty pretty much drama but i slashed through there and uh managed to keep my distance ahead of matt and we pull off the win and so a long story short about the car before we talk a little bit about the the victory lane celebration uh, we had we had drug the ductwork was at the very bottom of the valence to make more front down force and we had drugged the the bottom of the uh, ductwork so much that it that it opened up a hole about the size of a basketball or a football between a football and a basketball size hole in the bottom of the ductwork. So I lost all that downforce plus the air that was supposed to be going through the radiator. Part of it was coming down around underneath the car or the radiator, hot radiator air. It, it, it changed the air underneath the car. And so therefore it got tighter and it also made it, obviously, less fast. So it was a challenge to to beat uh, Matt and pull that off. But that's what happened to the car and why the car got tight. Back to the victory celebration. Matt had, uh, you know, Matt was pretty young. Uh, is maybe ten at this at this point, and 
all the way back in, you know, 98, 99, whenever they had, they started having these no bull five races. Like I was in the no bull five race at Charlotte. I'm sorry, at, at, uh, Indy. And even though Matt wasn't much of a race fan, he sure was a fan of winning a million dollars. Cause to Matt, you know, as a young, young kid, he thought if we won a million dollars, we'd be rich. And that would be the end of that story. So at Indy, I think it was 98, he told me before the race, now, Dad, don't be nervous. And he was at MRO watching the race with the other kids. And Jeff Gordon wins it, wins a no-bull five, and I run second to Gordon. And he jumps up and he says, I hate Jeff Gordon. You know, he was so pissed because he just thought if we could win a million dollars, that would be the end all be all to, to financial, uh, wherewithal for life. And so I think he was already asleep by the time this race was over. Cause it was, it was late and Arlene gets him up, wakes him up, hauls him up here to victory lane. And Matt was so freaking excited was such an amazing win because after 2001, I was afraid I would never win a race again. And people laugh at that. But sometime, you're, if you're lucky enough to win a race, it could sometime, if you win multiple races, sometime, if you win, it could be your last one. And I'm serious. I was scared that that I'd never win another one. And so it was a big win from that standpoint. It was a big win because it was such a team effort. And I felt like Ben Leslie had really carried that on his back. He said we were going to win that race back in April. He built a special body for that race. Uh, he did win tunnel testing. He knew what I wanted, what I needed. And then we did a test all pointing toward that and then the pit crew gets me out in front on the last pit stop so it was such a team effort and and matt was so excited and ben leslie's first cup win as a crew chief and almost everybody on the team was experiencing their first cup win in victory lane so it was just almost euphoric the pictures the photos from that victory lane where Coca-Cola is all over Matt's shirt and all over Arlene's shirt. Her shirt is wet and, uh, and my face is red from the heat. And I just look at that and I look at the enthusiasm on that team's face and it just, it's almost emotional for me. It was such an incredible feeling. So we move on from that. We continue to reel off top five finishes, top 10 finishes. Everything's, everything's pretty, pretty good to go. And then, uh, we're, we're leading the points. You know, I, I, I remember leading the points, leaving Dover in the fall. We run second at Dover. We're leading the points. We got a a nice little cushion on uh, Tony Stewart. And this is the year. This is the year that we do it. This is the year. This is finally after 12 years or after, you know, 11 years, 10 years after the debacle in 1990 where we, we wind up losing out on that championship and me thinking another one would come finally 10 years later, 11 years later, here we are. We're in good shape and all leading the points fall over race, just a handful of races left. And I go to Jack and I say, Jack, we just can't blow up. We just can't, we can't lose any motors. It doesn't matter how much power they have. I don't care about the power. 
We just can't break a motor. And so we go to Kansas the next week and we break a motor at the end of the race. And then we go to Talladega the next week and we get in a wreck. So there goes our point lead. There goes our point, you know, cushion. And then from there, we have a little trouble at Charlotte finish 16th, but then we go 10th, 8th, 2nd, 4th, and 4th the rest of the year. But, of course, it's not enough because we've already, you know, we've already lost, you know, we lost our points cushion. So we lose a championship to uh, Tony Stewart. And, uh, and so that kind of sums up the 2002 season. It was a great season, incredible win. After I was afraid I'd never win another race. Second place in the points. Very proud to rebound like that. Tons of top five finishes. And, uh, and so, you know, in the end, it was a very, very successful season to a stressful start because, you know, it was a big change to change, make that kind of, it was a ballsy change to change teams with Kurt. And it worked out fabulous for Kurt too. Jimmy was a perfect influence on Kurt and they had an incredible season and were able to just, uh, really, start Kurt Bush started really coming into his own. So tell us, I mean, what was Jimmy's thoughts when you, I mean, did you approach him about this change? Uh, what thoughts did he have? Was there any, any kind of resentment, anything going on there? I didn't discuss it with Jimmy. Jimmy and I were really close. And the last thing I'd ever want to do is disappoint Jimmy. But it's a performance-based business for he and I both. And I think Jimmy on the surface was fine with it, treated me just fine, never acted like he resented it. I was afraid that he resented it down below, you know, underneath. But it needed to be done. And incredibly, it was better for Jimmy. Jimmy started winning races, and Jimmy got a championship. And he may not have if, if we stayed together. We had just reached a point in 2000, at the end of 2001 where I don't know for sure if we could rekindle it and get it back or not. And he picked up the ball and started running with it with Kurt. He had him a great young driver, and it worked out fabulous for him, and he got a championship ring out of it down the road. So it was uh, the best thing for Jimmy. So that will wrap up year 2002 here on the Mark Martin Podcast. We want to send a special shout-out to a couple podcasts uh, that Mark has been on lately, Dale Jr. Download and others that have actually uh, picked up our subscribers. So if you're new to the podcast again, head over to the markmartinpod.com website, markmartinpod.com, click listen, and find us on your favorite podcast player. But that will do it for episode number 41 of the Mark Martin Podcast. Thank you for subscribing and listening to the Mark Martin Podcast. Remember to give us a five-star rating in your app store. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mark Martin POD. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network.